Welcome to this podcast. I'm your host, Zach Schwartz, and joining me today for kind of a, a different edition, I'd say, of the podcast, we're going to uh, talk about the differences in sports returning uh, in Europe with all the soccer leagues coming back and resuming play uh, this week with Spain a couple weeks ago in Germany and then next week in England, or I guess this week in England. Um, and we're recording this on Sunday. And with the American sports leagues, with the NBA and NHL, and of course, football in the fall. So I decided to have the only friend, I think, that's really lived in both Europe and America for an extended period of time. It's everybody's favorite Brit, Will Sheeran. Will, how you doing? Thank you very much, Zach. I'm doing well. Uh, lovely introduction there. Uh, made me laugh a little bit, but I'm really happy to be here again. I love doing these podcasts, and uh, I hope I can give you some knowledge about the uh, Europe as well. Yeah, for sure. And the first thing I do want to say is, obviously, you know, um, you've had family members that are working on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, you know, and I'm not going to go out there and say I'm anything like that, but I am studying to be uh, hopefully get into medical school uh, this upcoming year. And obviously, there are a lot of things that are. Uh, more serious than sports returning and especially with the economy and stuff like that um, I'm aware of that I am not a person that feels comfortable talking about that so therefore we're going to hit the lower hanging fruit here and discuss uh, different sports and sports leagues and their challenges when they return so but I feel like some people just, you know will, will attack you if you don't say that so I'm just putting that out there now uh, at the front and if you missed it you missed it and you don't get to tweet at me so there we go <laughs> Good disclaimer. Um, I'm in support of that. Uh, so could you, real quick, just for the people, uh, remind myself and them uh, exactly like where you uh, come from? Because obviously they, they've heard your accent by now, so they know you're from England and such. Um, but where exactly, and you're coming up and when you moved over here, just so you can give a good overview of how you actually know like how the different countries do work, especially with England and the U.S. Absolutely. So... Uh, I am obviously my name is Will Will Sheeran as I hopefully you've heard me a couple of times. So I grew up uh, in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, home of Newcastle United Football Club. Um, but my parents are both from Liverpool, so my mum supports Liverpool FC, the Mighty Reds, who are top of the league. Uh, my dad's side was born blue, so we support Everton, and of course that was handed down to me. So I've always been an Everton supporter, but I have a royal place in my heart for Newcastle United as well. And it's interesting this year in the league, they're only two points apart at the moment and a one position. So uh, really got two teams mid-table at the moment. Um, my mum's feeling very smug as Liverpool sit top of the league. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I've been over here in the States now since 2011. Uh, we've been over here a while. We've played football both uh, at the collegiate level over here in the USA. And I played growing up since I was a boy, probably about three when I first started kicking a ball, come to think of it. Um, over in the UK until at the age of 12. Yeah, so uh, quite the background there, obviously. Uh, I do also have to say that I made a couple jokes with Everton and Newcastle in my upcoming story about the return of the English Premier League. So just that Everton, right. of course, are in the mid-table. Yeah, yeah. Yep, it's fine. Not, not worried about that one. I will add for the people as well that my accent is a classic Newcastle. It seems to uh, blend in when I'm back or talking about it. So uh, just because that's where I grew up. So, you know, if you're from Newcastle, you talk very, you know, in a Geordie accent and it's very heavy like this. Like, but, you know, if you're in the Northwest and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're going down the ma football match, uh, you're going down the match at Goodison Park. It's just a very <laughs> different accent. And to me, I'm not genuinely putting that on. That is genuinely what I grew up around. And the way I was taught in school, so it was always quite kind of a modest, neutral voice and being over here as well. Uh, my accent's not as strong, but... It's funny when people say, um, we're, when we're talking, my family amongst ourselves, uh, people say we sound a little uh, a little more, uh, what did they say, like pronounced when we're with each other is the polite way of saying, I have absolutely no idea, as an American, what you three are saying. So that's always a good laugh. And I know you've played football with me over the years, Zach, and you've heard me have a right, right go at someone uh, for something or other along the lines, and it, it, it gets pretty broad, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you can definitely yeah. tell when you're uh, when you get frustrated, and then uh, or when I was on your right side, and you just be like. I, I obviously can't do it, but you should be like, Zach, get your ass over here on the post and do this now. <laughs> and you can tell when, uh, when the anger level rose in training or in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the game setting, but all good fun, of course. So, um, Absolutely. You knew I never meant anything. I would never have a go in fantasy with the most trusty right back I think I've played with uh, over no, the years. That, that's too kind. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean that, though. You, you listened, which was an easy thing to do. <laughs> so I uh, but you and I really became close mates as well doing this as well. It's all part of the story, and I'm, I'm really glad and ready to get into this and make you laugh a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think I think everyone's obviously aware uh, with the issues that surround uh, these leagues and sport leagues return. Uh, baseball has a little bit of a, a different thing going on right now, but we, we may be able to talk about that later because uh, it's very similar to other parts of the economy, right? I know you're, you just got into an internship right now, a high-profile internship, so congratulations, but I'm sure you guys are also struggling with it as well. Is that, all right, well, we're going to have to test employees welcoming them into certain areas. We're going to have to pay for all those tests, which is a problem when you're not taking in, in any revenue at the moment. Um, there's problems with, you know, obviously if someone gets Corona and then they go, are supposed to be scheduled to play a match in the next couple of days, how does that work? Do you quarantine only the person? Do you quarantine the team? That's been an issue that, uh, some of the soccer leagues have been working on because there have been a couple positive tests. I know in the lower leagues of German football recently, um, and also just like with the calendar and stuff like that with, with those kind of things for some of these sports that ramp up. So um obviously we've seen the german league for at least a month or so i believe or three weeks Mm -hmm. spanish league returned this week uh great applause my catalans for nothing win over uh (laughs) for barcelona yesterday uh fantastic loved it um and then the premier league is following up on wednesday coming back with a couple fixtures and such so uh, how much soccer have you been able to watch, obviously, with how busy you've been? But also, what what are your first kind of impressions of it? Obviously, there's no fans. Uh, that's kind of been a prerequisite for this. I know people for college football have been discussing the possibility of having socially distant stadiums, which is crazy. Um, so it's a whole other conversation and stuff. But what's been your big takeaway from the last couple weeks of uh, of European soccer returning? My first takeaway, Zach, is uh, Barcelona's away kit is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I haven't really had a chance to watch the European leagues prior, as I always favour the Premier League. Uh, in, but I have watched a lot of the Bundesliga. Uh, I've been fantastic watching that. It's been brilliant. Uh, Dortmund, I really enjoy. Bayern Munich, in my opinion. Uh, I hate to say it, but they are the best team in, in Europe. Uh, I, I truly do believe that. I think they play a really good style of football. They're young, enthusiastic. It's been really interesting to watch. But also on the other end of the league, you look at Fortuna Dusseldorf, who put up a good fight. They're a good good side. You know, that league is as as competitive as other leagues in Europe, if not more so. Going around the stadiums as well, uh, I think it's really interesting having no fans, but a necessary precaution as well. You'll be able to speak to this as well. Did you see the uh, pitch invader that uh, came in to try and take a photo with Messi the other day in the Barcelona game? You know, that's a huge problem from a security breach of he could have been anyone. We don't know where he's been. And these tech players and other Premier League has had eight, now eight rounds of testing. And I know that every club has taken major precautions. You look at the Premier League and Norwich has now just confirmed that another player has had COVID and that was today. And they're going, oh no, like does this postpone the league to the lower divisions, as you said, in Germany? It's been great that people are getting back into football But what I will stress for the audience as well is this is still an ongoing pandemic and people need to realize that it's not going to be normal overnight and our new normal is going to be different. Ultimately, I've been able to work through a pandemic uh, in a couple of stints. It is unstable and uncertain times, but we all have to do our part to stay safe and help ultimately society remain on its feet. From an economic standpoint, there is a lot to go into it. And my heart bleeds for small businesses that have struggled or have even lost businesses during this. Don't get me wrong. But ultimately, at the end of the day, health and safety is our main priority. And that is really key. I would also just like to take a second as well to the audience, and I should have said it earlier, to just say thank you to all of the medical uh, professionals 
and uh, assistance uh, in a wide variety of uh, fields in the medical field uh, for combating every day, working long and hard hours uh, to keep keep everyone else safe and try and flatten the curve ultimately. My hat goes off to all of you and I commend you all. I also commend those who have been working from home in their jobs as well in order to, uh, to change the way that their businesses work. No matter how far away from the medical field it may be, this has impacted every single one of us. Even kids, we're all at home, we're all doing certain things and it's important to remember to do your part. Yeah, of course. I mean, a lot of responsibility you know, has been put put upon us, and still, you know, trying to be a, l- a little bit smart with things that are going out. You know, I think there's been obviously some restrictions have been eased, but also, you know, just don't be don't be stupid uh, as well out there. And of course, what you mentioned with the medical professionals is very key. And I also think you hit on the main point there is that you know, so far with the Bundesliga and La Liga, at least. Um, that these, you know, these leagues can plan, obviously they can have all this sort of, um, you know, uh, thought and requirements and such for all these teams, um, such like that. But as soon as one person gets a, uh, gets a positive test, it, it all falls down a bit. So I'm not sure. I'll, I'll see if there's been any news on the Norwich, uh, situation. Um, I joked to you pre-show that, uh, if Norwich were to play, it doesn't really matter anyway, because they're, they're a couple <laughs> points adrift. It doesn't seem like they're gonna, they're gonna make it sadly. And I, uh, I, I I know I wrote a post for the assistpodcast.com about uh, La Liga recently going through all 20 teams, kind of saying, all right, this is what they have to play for left and such like that. And when it came time to predict my relegation teams, I mean, Norwich, I was just like, yeah, Norwich are going down. Let's, that's a fact. Let's move on now. Let's, let's talk about Villa. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, joke's on that, but it, it is true because you see these proposals like the NBA, you know, the NHL and such like that, and you're like, all right, that, you know, they, they don't necessarily specify – if someone's positive, you know, what happens? Do you quarantine the team? I mean, what's and the thing as well is that I don't think people necessarily talk about that much, but a lot of these players, you know, are 20 to 40 ish, you know, in that, in that demographic that necessarily hasn't made up a big proportion of serious of deaths and such like that. So, I mean, you can do the thing where it's all right. Well, they're the fittest, very fit athletes should be okay. Um, but you're going to restrict them from seeing the rest of their family, you know, and stuff like that. And I think that's what, I don't know how much you've been watching. I mean, the UFC has been doing this uh, for a couple of weeks now. A very much easier sport, obviously. You're dealing with two fighters plus camp people. So like maybe 10 people in the ring at once. And you're not, you don't have to deal with 22 players plus managers plus that blah, blah, blah. Um, and they've been able to test to get the amount of tests they need and such like that to continue that on. And, you know, whenever a, t- a fighter's test positive, it's like, all right, we're canceling the fight. We'll move it to next week. And, th- and it's super easy for them to do mm-hmm. it. But I, and I think um, it reminded me of another issue that I heard is that uh, I heard about this in reference to a Ryan Russell podcast about college football recently. And they're talking about how, uh, you know, football is a whole other mess we get into. But that the coaches a lot of times are older, you know. I mean, we joke about Barcelona, but if someone gets – if Messi tests positive, um, you know, Kike Sentien, the Barcelona manager, is 60 or something. And now he's in that demographic yeah. that's had real problems. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Because that, that's the part of the proposals that they don't really necessarily say all the time. Yeah, I think it's an interesting part, especially as when you look at the demographic. Uh, ultimately, to go uh, towards the fans, there's no chance you're going to have fans yet, and that's okay. I think you know the rounds of testing are great, and to bring this into my own experience in college, you know, it's interesting to see what the NCAA will do as well. We plan to have a few games, but we won't have fans, and we'll be lucky if we do, and that's okay. But as you said, you brought a good point there about the Barcelona's manager being above 60 and in that demographic. This is, people need to realize across the world, most places are taking it seriously, just how important it is and how cruel this virus may be. We've worked through things like SARS. We've worked through the, the Spanish flu. We as a society will get through this as well. And I think that's important to remember that it will, better days will come. But that will come sooner if we take precaution, so when you said about you know the fans and things, you know is there is there a level of does he have to sit in a press box when he's doing a game? He isn't at the moment, 
but maybe that's something that's going to happen to do. We used to, I remember we did a podcast and laughed about uh, Sar- uh, Maurizio Sarri, who's a, a he did he proved himself well in the end. But the man used to smoke like a chimney, and he still does. And that's his life choice. And if he wants to do that, fair play to him. But surely that's going to impact his immune system. And you mm-hmm. think, okay, how is he going to? How is he curbing his virus? And I'd be interested to see. I mean, like Italy. I, I I may be wrong, and I'm not a medical professional, but that is a a country that smoking is a big part of their culture, and they all struggled for a very very long time. Spain as well. So I think the answer to that is they need to just take precaution day by day, almost hour by hour, and just be careful ultimately across the world. And I'm glad that sports are coming back. You know, I remember we, you and I spoke about Florida making it, it deemed it essential, didn't they, as an essential business. Okay, great. But there's got to be certain ways we do it in a way that's respectful and ultimately safe. And I, I'll leave it at that, and I can't, I can't go much more into that. Um because I'm not, I'm, I'm not the professional, and I think that if we do the adequate testing, we'll be okay. Granted, if you're younger and fitter, that's fantastic. But again, this could happen to anyone. As we see, players are not immune to getting it. We're all human. We can all get it at any point. We just don't know how severe. Right. Yeah, so it looks like, uh, according to Goal.com, with the statement from Norwich, that the Premier League's protocol is a player without a scythe. Oof. That's a bad grammar. Self-isolate right. <laughs> for a period of seven days before being tested again at a later date. The player must return a negative test result uh, before being able to resume training. And they didn't name who it was, but um, they will not be appearing in their first game against Southampton on Friday. So that's kind of the seven days So of self-isolation for players who test positive seems to be the Premier League's policy. So, and of course, they've... Yeah. Uh, some Premier League clubs have been able to um, play for some friendlies as well. I know Spain's clubs did not get a chance to do that before they started, so it looks like that's where it might have been picked up. But, I'm sure um, that people will figure out with Norwich exactly who it was as soon as it was. But I'm glad the friendlies were there. Have you seen some of the results? Arsenal had a nightmare. They lost 3-2 to Brentford. Who, In fairness to Brentford, their promotion pushing. Uh, they are. They. I wouldn't be surprised if they come up next year. They're a good side out of North London. They're going to do well. But I tell you what, it did make me laugh watching uh, Arsenal get beaten by them after fielding a full eleven. David Louise was having a shocker. But in Brentford, look quite good. They look quite good. Do you remember the first two leagues in England are playing League One and League Two? So the third and fourth division of the tier pyramid in the UK have said nope. We are ending our season. So that's been interesting to see the backlash with that. But because of the push towards the Premier League, the championship is still going along with the Premiership as well. I believe the French League uh, canceled as well, right? They did cancel. You're right. They yeah. just said, ah, oh, yeah, PSG and Miles ahead, go with it. And uh, I'm not surprised, but, you know, the French, they like to do their own things their own way and uh, back down from a challenge every once in a while. And that's okay. They did win a World <laughs> Cup. So that's okay. I'll give them that. Uh, they, they tell you what, they've got a very, very talented national side and they will do extremely well for a very long time. Uh, I'm just trying to... But, yeah. Holland cancelled as well. That was right. the other one. Yeah. But they I was just trying to think they because... Didn't award a, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just, just going to say they didn't award a title though in Holland. They gave one in France, but Holland said, nope, this season's void. Right. I remember seeing that, yeah. It's uh, it's been interesting to see those kind of clubs, especially with you know Spain and Italy coming back after they were probably the two. We haven't looked at the numbers recently, but probably the two hardest countries hit uh, early on as well. Um, the thing I wanted to say with France is that you know there's been rumors of when the Champions League will come back. Uh, obviously, that will take intercontinental travel, so we're probably a, a bit away from that. Obviously, I don't know if you saw it. You're not the biggest UFC fan, but the UFC decided to get around international travel restrictions by uh, building or re- renovating, I guess, since they already had the island. But <laughs> to, they created Fight Island in, in the UAE to have international oh fighters, God. and that is starting July 11th. And truly, it's brilliant because, right. I mean, a lot of the UFC's base is foreign, and so you don't want to use up all your American fighters you know, for the time. So. They're they're going to the UAE for that, which is crazy. Obviously, you can't do that in soccer. Um, 
<laughs> and I do want to bring up a, a point about the the home stuff later because I think it's interesting based on some differences uh, between America and the Europe's plan. But what I was going to say was uh, France still have teams in the Champions League. So whenever that comes back, I mean, you, you got to think if yeah. I, I saw something that they had a target date possibly for the Champions League in August and September when the domestic leagues are done, which would be weird, but I'm down for it. But if you do that, you're going to have clubs like Manchester City, you know, like even Atlanta, who's already into the quarterfinals um, from the previous pre-pandemic season, previous season, pre-pandemic uh, <laughs> Champions League fixtures. But you have clubs like Lyon, who are still playing Juventus, and then uh, PSG, who are also through to the... Um, to the quarterfinals already, and they're not going to have any real matches. Whereas, you know, you have teams like Barcelona that'll just come off of potentially either winning a title or contesting it. Atletico Madrid, who are in a dogfight to be in next year's Champions League as well, playing meaningful matches for the next two months. Napoli, same thing. Um, RB Leipzig, same thing. And those clubs aren't, you know, that, that's kind of crazy to think about. Um, I know PSG is usually a choker in the Champions League anyway, but that's another interesting thing that I didn't even think of until just now. Um, mm-hmm. that could possibly happen. Yeah, there's a number of problems that can emerge from this, and I think it's really interesting to see. As you said then, the Champions League in Europe is going to be really interesting, as you said, with the French team still in it. But ultimately, the borders are closed. Uh, unless you play on a neutral site, I know Australia initially said, yeah, you can finish the Premier League here. I mean, maybe they'll pick a site like that. Um, but ultimately, you've got to remember, for, again, from health and safety, is that the right move? Is that the safest move? And will that happen? And I, I just simply don't know. I think I think the UFC have got a decent idea with Fight Island. Fair play to them. Uh, it's, it's unique. But can you do that on a large-scale footballing business, really? As you said, Atletico uh, have put in a brilliant claim uh, as an Everton fan I'm in full support of. And so are Watford, and I'll get to it why. Is, uh, their president said, well, if we can't play the rest of the Champions League season, it should be given to the team that beat the reigning champions, which, of course, they beat Liverpool this season, <laughs> pre-pandemic. And I went, yeah, I'm in full support of that. And uh, Watford have said, oh, OK, we like the idea of that because they're the only team that beat Liverpool in the Premier League too. And quite honestly, I couldn't stop laughing. I think it would be great. if Imagine if Watford got given the title. <laughs> well, obviously, that's not going to happen. But, or Atletico. But as you said, they're in a right dogfight. So maybe that's their best bet. If, well, hold on. Let's see. And I'd be, I will be interested to see what happens with the uh, Champions League and what UEFA does there. It's interesting that domestic leagues go on. My parallel for our American viewers is to remember that it's the equivalent. UEFA is kind of like the federal government versus the states um, having their own state government, which would be each domestic league. Uh, which I think is important to note as well, uh, because it is. It's very, very different. Right, and uh, we've definitely never had any issues with UEFA and FIFA making incorrect no, choices ne- for no, money never, or anything never. like that. Never, no. They're, they're, they're just the furthest from corrupt, you can imagine. They are the ideal business. <laughs> So here's something though that's interesting because you talk about obviously the the continental stuff and sometimes I think of Europe and the United States as a better comparison than just the U.S. and these different countries based on size. But having lived in both of those kind of areas, because I think I'm sure you've seen a lot of the NBA and NHL's returns are predicated on the fact that all the teams that are invited, right? So for the NBA, it's 22, I believe. And then the NHL will be restarting with 24 teams in their current. Those are, And once again, these are the current iterations of their plan. Um, they might come out with something in a half hour that would make these obsolete. But that's what I've been hearing. And that they will all quarantine in one city together. It's limited access for the NBA. It's been stated it'll be Orlando and Disney World. Uh, the NHL has not selected a city for that yet. So basically a bubble, right? That's what they're planning to do. They're planning to do a type of bubble thing. Whereas I think it's interesting that in Spain and England and in Germany, even though there's no fans, these uh, teams are still traveling to uh, from stay in the stadium. Excuse me. It's not – they're not in a the bubble. They're not anything like that. Um, 
they're they're still home games they're still away games literally i mean obviously you know the, the they are no fans so the advantage is a little bit less than usual but they're still moving and they're still traveling whereas everyone's going to be playing in orlando uh for the nba so so what do you think about that like why do you think that's been such a big concern for sports leagues here in america whereas europe it seems to be doing okay um good that is a great question uh, the answer is, I, I think Europe, when you say it, is doing okay. If you, if the way I look at it is a kind of a bit of a timeline. If we go back a little bit, remember Europe was getting slammed with this horrible, nasty virus before America had a first case, and it was kind of like, oh God, what's going on in Europe? And oh, what's this virus that started out east? And that's that's okay. But remember, as we've started to emerge. Uh, Europe is kind of woke up from the nightmare and is kind of coming around, you know, when you first wake up in the morning, you're gathering where you are and what's ahead in the day. America's still largely in a nightmare, I think, and people are desperate to get out of the nightmare and maybe it's a mate shaking them and trying to wake them up. It's probably the best uh, best way I can kind of parallel it um, really and I think that's why Europe is a step ahead on opening these leagues and doing them with the precautions. Granted, the testing is expensive. You know, this is, remember, lower league clubs, remember, only two, only two tiers of English football are playing. You know, the third and the fourth probably won't have the funds to do that. You know, you've got a lot of people, they're still on a heavy lockdown in um, the UK. As of today, this coming out um, on Sunday, June 14th, the UK had to confirm another 1,425 cases today and another 36 deaths. That is still a catastrophic problem. Uh, and, you know, and each state here is adding up. And the US as well, remember, is a huge country. And the UK is a tiny island. They're able to open their football up, I think, because they've got the money in the league to do it. Ultimately, we still see gaps in the system. As you said, the Norwich player who will be missing the first game, he's ha- clearly had it. You've got, you know, on the other side to that, you've got 7.5 roughly of, uh, million um, cases that have been confirmed worldwide with 143,000 deaths. And America has roughly about a third of those. And that's, that's not to say, and I'm not going to get political with this, it's nothing to do with the politics. It's also to do with the fact that it's such a massive country, there are simply more people here as well. But people in the UK have listened as much as they can, and I'm not saying that they're perfect because there's still many that have breached it and didn't care for a very long time and made the problem worse, that have listened and gone, oh, okay, this lockdown is serious. In the U.S., then that's part of your constitution, your right to do what, basically whatever you want, and I'm okay with that. I'm a citizen. I'm, I'm applying for my citizenship here. I like that, and I like the way the laws work. But to me, there are some, and then in every country, there's always going to be people that abuse it and take it too far. For instance, not wearing a mask, for example, because you feel that it's not going to work, may not be the greatest idea on trying to flatten a curve. But then you come back to the leagues, ultimately, and wrap this back round. It's going to naturally take a bit longer uh, in, a, in a large country that has got laws like this. You know, China today, Beijing is back in a lockdown. Uh, you know, touch wood, there won't be a second wave. And I, Dr. Fauci and his team also think there may not be a second wave on a huge if. And that if is if we all take other precautions necessary. And I think that's going back to the sport. Is It'd be great. I'd love to see the NBA. I've, I'm not a huge basketball fan, but it'd still be nice just to watch live sports properly. Uh, it'd be great to watch a bit of hockey. You know, I'd love to see the MLS kind of start up. I know their seasons are a bit weird because it's America and they like to make things a bit different anyway. But I'd love to see more football happen. I'd love to see it climb around the world you know, and you remember these restrictions are slowly starting to ease. In South Africa, they've only just started letting people have a, a bit of alcohol and letting people in the house. That's a huge start. That's not covered on the news here. And that's OK, because there's a lot of other things and current events going on that we won't get into. But I think that 
soon and if we all do our part it will make our curve flatten and i think things will come back in an even more safe manner because remember the even these leaders who are coming up are, and trying to do their best and ultimately in some it's their living as well bringing these leagues back is gonna it's not gonna happen overnight but it's also got to be well thought through because imagine just imagine zach if uh you know you're a detroit fan so if, if the pistons come back and they're playing the Milwaukee Bucks, for example. Wisconsin's interested in what they've decided to do throughout their uh, time during this pandemic. But, you know, you come back and it turns out that one player has had it or is a carry and it didn't test positive. Then both teams get it. And then, you know, if you've got a few fans in there as well, maybe one of them gets it. You know, and this can come from any sort of contact, whether that's, you know, an elbow bump to shake hands, but basketball's a hand, a very handsy, hands-on, no pun intended, sport. You know, it doesn't seem to sit on there, but, you know, this can come from sweat pores. It, it's, it, it's interesting to see. And I think that we've all just, got, again, I think we've got to take our time with it. And we are taking our time, but ultimately we can't just get bored of it as a nation Brazil, Bolsonaro, clearly he's having a nightmare, but he's kind of got bored with reporting it because he's realised he hasn't got a great handle on it. But he's kind of like, oh, it's not, it's not really a problem. But we've, and you can't move on too quick. Is I know it's boring. We've all sat in our houses over a hundred days now, but ultimately it's really, really important. <laughs> um, you know, because this, you know, we we will see better days, and I'm really optimistic that we will. But we've got to do it politely. So, yes, the answer to it is I am pleased that European sports are coming back. I hope American sports are there. But I hope when they do it, they bring the right precautions in, mirroring something similar to the European leagues, which still see its cracks. I'm not saying they've done it perfectly, because it will be a very different experience for a very long time, I think, maybe a year or so. And I think it's important to note that I think colleges... I know Alabama football went back and they had a few cases early on within their first week. Again, that's not to say anyone's careless or anything. That's just the nature of it. And people will get sick. People will move on and that's not going to go away. This virus is probably, you know, coronavirus as a whole and different strands of it have been around for years. We just don't know how to treat this one yet, but we will get there. We will. But we've got to be safe. And ultimately, I'd love my senior season. I would love to have one more year playing football. But if I have to be safe, I have to be safe. And I, But I trust my school. I trust the people in it. And I trust the leagues we play in to do it in a respectful and timely manner. So we've got to have a bit of faith there. But for the audience, just be patient. Try a new sport that's open, even if you don't like soccer. Just try watching something. You know, I've got. You know, I'd like to start watching the UFC myself. I know that we'll I will have a new appreciation for all sports when we come back. Sorry, that's my tangent over. I know I've talked there, but I thought it was important. No, of course it, it really is, and I do <laughs> want to touch on obviously your season and also in conjunction with other sports uh, coming up uh, about this because I think there's some. You, uh, we could do a whole podcast on the college athletic side of this for sure because there's going <laughs> to be. Because a lot of people just don't know how it works, and and there's a if college football isn't here, there's going to be a lot of issues uh, for for a lot of different athletic departments. So uh, we can touch on that in a second. Um, what I also want to say too is when you know we're talking about this and and the pandemic and all these different uh, tests and stuff. And what's really interesting is that obviously there's no fans, and I think that's accepted, of course, for the NBA, uh, for the NHL, especially with the hub cities, of course. Uh, that they are discussing, and obviously with the um, with the soccer leagues that we've already seen return, I wonder with um, if if the TV deals are a little different. I don't know if you've noticed, mm -hmm. but with Spain, but with Spain at least, I think the Premier League's doing the same thing. Every single game has its own time slot now throughout the throughout the uh, couple days. Uh, yeah. that they're playing them. And of course, uh, I think England's doing something similar as well. Spain's doing two games a week. So Barcelona play again on Tuesday, which is crazy. Uh, so it's going to be a very fast finish with 10, 10, 11 games left for both, both leagues. But I think it's really interesting that uh, with no fans, obviously with no need really with live gate revenue that they're going, all right, game at eight, game at 11, game at one yeah. 30, game at four next day. 
And it's just that you could reasonably watch every single game if you have BN Sports, of course. But for the Premier League yeah. with NBC, I believe they're doing the, the same thing that these television companies are so starved of content right now that they're like, all right, we're going to show eight hours a day of soccer. You can check in anytime you want. And you can honestly watch the last, let's see, there's 10 match days left times 10 games, oh, 100 games or so. Yeah. Uh, that's yep. nice math. Boom. Thank you. Well done. Easy. <laughs> uh, if I couldn't do 10 times 10, that'd be tough. That'd be, that'd be a tough look here. Um, but that point. you can reasonably go in there and then you could literally watch any amount that you want. And I think the NBA is looking at doing that as well. So I think that's interesting. I don't know how much revenue they can recoup uh, from not having fans, but it is a, it is certainly a different strategy that I've seen that they're they're incorporating now. That's a great point. I never thought about it in that sense, but I did notice they had their own time slots. But yeah, I mean, you could as an audience and how, you know, we're all going to be watching this from nowhere else but home, you know, maybe in the odd state, the odd bar at a socially distanced. But you're right. I mean, you're sitting in a stadium, especially for, for me, the biggest stadium I've been to was actually the Ohio uh, State Stadium, the, the Shoe. You know, I remember being there a number of years ago now, but just remember the sheer size of it. You can't do that for a while during this pandemic. But as you said, the TV rights can come back. That is that is a really good point. I, I haven't thought about that. I think they'll that recouping the revenue will take a little while. Uh, actually, I don't think they will be able to get it fully. But ultimately, hopefully, and I'd be interested to see what they're doing in Europe as well. Because remember, it's kind of not a, the same system. Most people watch the BBC. I'm sure the games will be on televised all the time. So it's a way of life more over there versus a, a choice channel like NBC, which is a great channel. I absolutely love it. It's been my uh, go to every Saturday and Sunday morning uh, and sometimes midweek for the last nine years I've been here which is brilliant and I really really think it's great there was one other point that you brought up which may be interesting when you said Barcelona play again on uh, Tuesday so I've just watched Real Madrid play in their uh, training stadium because uh, Florentino Perez is doing his own thing and making his own renovations during the middle of a pandemic but that's another story um, what I think is really interesting. It's just the, the sheer level of fitness that I think fans and uh, listeners will need to remember as well is just how much demanding the end of this season is going to be on players uh, in any sport. That is, if you, I mean, basketball looks exhausting. They already play a heavy schedule as it is, but with soccer, you know, to recover and play a game back on Tuesday. You know, lower leagues and the championship, there's a whole joke about it being a bit of a dogfight. And it is hard to win the championship and get out of the championship because you're playing sometimes three, four times a, game, a week. Um, but that's kind of what the COVID's going to do. And remember, they all lose their summer breaks. They normally get about a six week break, don't they? Uh, but they've then, you know, you could argue, yeah, but they've just had three months off. But those three months have been a time of fear, uncertainty. And also a commitment to stay as supremely fit as possible in order for this return. It's great that you're seeing players coming back who you haven't seen in a while, who are now able to come back into full health. But also remember, there's going to be people that unfortunately, touch were not many, will lose their seasons as well due to coming back and getting injured. It's, it's, it's really important to remember as a, as a fan, you know, you may see rotations. Barcelona might bring guys up from the youth team uh, and get some minutes. I know Bayern Munich certainly did. Uh, and, you know, you've got big games there. So, for instance, my team, Everton, are playing the Merseyside Derby as their first game back. God, I mean, what what a situation to be thrown into. You come back from a global pandemic and your first team is the team that is a mile across from you that you haven't beaten in uh, disgracefully 10 years. But, you know, you've had a, the odd tie, but you've now got to focus everything but then what happens, you know, maybe that's the Sunday or the Monday, but then you play again, say, the, the next Wednesday. You know, you've got a field of full 11. Will that be then younger guys getting the chance? I watched some of the Bayern Munich game the other day, and they brought their forwards up from the second team to give them a run out because they didn't have Lewandowski or Muller. And I thought, hmm, it's interesting. But hopefully, as again, being positive, there will be light, and younger guys hopefully will get their time to shine and break through. So let's look at it in that way. And that goes not just in football, but in every sport as well. Hopefully other people can have their time or their ch chance to deem their own bit of success. And that's not to shun anyone who's currently playing 
because they also deserve it and you never wish injury or any ill ill grace on anyone ultimately but i i think there will be some positives and i think some new faces will come in some rotations will come in and maybe just maybe it'll change the way games are played across a multitude of sports whether that's lineups i know they've been given more substitutes as well in the uh, bundesliga i believe they're allowed five a game now which is a lot to try and rest them yeah i know the uh the five subs is all all over that's for every league i think it's a fifa oh, mandate Good. so yeah i do well, want to say uh yeah of course I do want to say one thing about what you were saying about the horseshoe, um, which I know it's the largest stadium you've been. Not to flex, but you know, Michigan Stadium is, is the biggest. Um, yeah, I've been yeah, there. Uh, <laughs> but no, you're right. And they've said, obviously, what you were saying, I believe. Let's see. I, I pulled it up while you were talking because I remember hearing about this. Oh, yeah, here you go. So Ohio Stadium, um, in addition to being ugly, holds 100,000 fans, 102,000 okay. exactly. And the athletic director of Ohio State, Gene Smith, uh, this is on May 20th is the latest story about this, so uh, a couple weeks old. But they, he was talking about how if there have been working models with social distancing framework of that they could actually still hold twenty to 22,000, around 30,000 people in the horseshoe for games in the fall, which, I mean – I love college football. All right, I love it. I've it's my first real Absolutely. sport. I fell in love with. I've, I've addicted to it. I made a whole college football mathematical model for it. I mean, I've I, you know it's it's been it's been deep. That being said, it's great. it is. But that being said, if I have to go and socially distance at a college football game. It's just it just takes away it takes away from everything and I know personally for UCF at least I'm not sure what a UNE has University of New England has rolled out for any plans for the fall but I know for us we have a mandatory mask rule on campus so you know, I'm going to go to a football game with a mask on like I, I understand being safe and all that stuff but come on <laughs> like that's that's just not the it's not the right environment uh, for that and I think it'd be much better just not to have any at all if you're going to do it like that you see what I'm saying. I agree. I mean, I, I, you're tied to a point there in Europe. You're starting to see crowd noises that are being pre-recorded, being played. But ultimately, you know, you think of the, the third down, uh, third and one. You've got the uh, crowds and the noise that comes out of them. It's going to be muffled within a mask. And I'm not saying take your mask, masks off and go by any means. But you bring up a good point. You know, the no fans rule will be interesting. My university, the University of New England, have said, uh, yes, we'd like to welcome our students back on campus. They welcomed that back a, a, actually a long time back. It was a big commitment. They were one of the first schools to do it. Uh, but I know that they've got um, in place already uh, precautionary screens around certain you know desks and things. Everything will be socially distanced and it'll be a very different atmosphere for every student in every different school across the country. And hopefully everyone's safe. But that being said, I'm sure people across the country, again, will probably unfortunately get this and hopefully they'll recover. Most people do remember. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, we've been told that, yeah, we won't have fans at our games, which is a bit weird for your final season because for us it'll feel a bit like a training match. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at least these players and pro leagues and whatnot and football, American football are going in and playing at their stadiums. That's great. And we can do that as well, but it's still a, it's still going to be very different. It's going to be a very different environment, but it will be strange. And uh, I thought that in Europe, I thought it was a good idea having the crowd noises, to be quite honest. It's something unique, I think, for the players. Is I don't know if you've noticed on the cameras, you pick up the noise, even if it's a challenge, you hear that, ow, or the, oh, you know, and you hear that more because it's usually muffled by the crowd. And as you said, uh, I mean, Ohio State, because I remember that number, 102 you know no stadium in europe is that big not even camp new which is huge um yep. and that i mean but you've got to you've you've got to keep it safe and uh, twenty thousand. i mean yeah if you can do it that's great but here's my question how do you dismiss people and you know you could go on with factors for hours and there's different things that go into this um but how would you ultimately dismiss people would you do it by section would you do it by row? Because remember, you and you've left games, whether that's uh, soccer, that's American football. It's usually a bun fight to the car, isn't it? You know, my, yep. my dad famously in American football games, even though watching the Browns, he'd be like, "All right, it's the fourth quarter, and there's about five minutes left. Can we go now?" And 
And like, I'd always joke, like, no, no, come on, it's close, it's there. And it'd be like, yeah, but we need to get the car. But how do you do that from now on? Do you dismiss it slowly? Do you, um, you know, it, it, there's many different ways and different views that you come on. I think it's interesting the subs in Germany have to come on and put a mask on immediately. And you're like, okay, fair enough, but you've just played a full game against a whole opposition as well. You know, you've been handling each other, you've been tackling, it's interesting. But I get it. I get it. And I yeah. think revenue is going to be interesting for college sports. Um, you know, gate receipts, especially for big division ones. I'm obviously division three. But, you know, it's still, you know, parents and fans still like, we don't charge. But it's it's still important. And it's still going to be something really a big deal. But I think a D, most D1 schools should, in my opinion, maybe I have a bias, should be able to get through at least a season. It won't hit them. I mean, it will hit them, but it won't hit them that hard if you don't have fans. You, they'll live. They'll live. Yeah, I think uh, going on to your point about the German substitutes, I think I've been thinking about in a couple months when all of the sports been back for for a couple of weeks, you know, and also just when I go out go out into the into the world bravely. Um, just all the people where it's like, all right, you you went halfway here. But it's like, what, what are you accomplishing Accomplishing right now? Like, what are you, what are you actually, like, trying to do like, with all the, right. like, the UFC cornermen when they have all of their, their masks on, but then when they're trying to yell, they just take them off and then put them back on. It's like, all right, what, what are we actually accomplishing right. by doing this doing this here? Um, so that reminds me of that. But uh, I do think uh, seamless transition here by you. Well done. Uh, talking about college sports. <laughs> I'm just going to say this because people have been asking and people have been out there saying, how could this happen? How could football happen? College football is going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen oh, yeah. because if it does not, yeah. there are going to be catastrophic um, issues with money and the funding of sports like yours, no offense, that are just that don't generate a ton of revenue. Like men's soccer for a lot of programs doesn't generate revenue, and that is why many programs – uh, many schools, many big public schools, including like Mac schools here in Ohio, don't have college men's college soccer teams. All well, Title IX, whole other yep. issue, but uh, yep. it makes sense. Yep. It makes sense in that case. And in fact, Cincinnati. Cincinnati, yep, yeah, Cincinnati just cut their men's program, didn't they? Yes, they did. So, and I know Bowling Green cut their baseball program, and then it got saved because of a donor, just as like here, or at least a donor God. page saved it, uh, which is great for for those kids. Um, but if we don't. I'm not even saying if. There's going to be college football because of it. You just know that. It's just how it's going to look. Um, and you're talking about, you talked about a timeline earlier. So you're looking at college football. That timeline's late August, early September, right there. Uh, so there's a while away. I know you mentioned Alabama. Players, welcome back. Um, I can also say UCF welcomed, I think, 60 or so back to wow. work out on June 1st. Uh, yeah. and a couple did test positive, uh, naturally. <laughs> but I think, I think if you take 60 people especially younger guys, you know, 20s, in your 20s. Um, you know, they, I, I think if you take any representative of 60 of those kids, uh, they're, they're going to test positive. So it doesn't even – I don't think they shut it down. I think Houston might have shut down their programs recently. I just I did just see that. Um, so it's it, – I mean, I think as long as workouts start in July, it's going to be okay. But it is – it, it's difficult, and obviously like you're saying like there, um, you're you're hearing that there would be no fans, which makes sense. And like we kind of touched on, I think it would just make sense to have no fans. Although uh, I know uh, once again Ryan Rosillo uh, and a couple other people were talking about like SEC schools, you know, and that SEC fans, you know, they'd be in there eighty eighty thousand people would be there right now today if Alabama were playing Auburn. And truthfully, yeah. I'm just being honest. Based on what I've been seeing, and I may or may I, I'm getting an antibody test this week, so we could see okay. if this if this bears it out, because uh, I do now know that it, I've I've been exposed. Um, so, because uh, I, I don't know if you've seen this, and maybe I should publicize this a little bit that some blood uh, blood donors are doing uh, a free antibody test if you go and give blood. So Katie and I are going to do that. Um, Good. To I get that. I so yeah, that's that's so we'll see about that, but. You know, if if it's September, I'm not saying the. I mean, well, actually, UCF's first game I want to say is August 31st against North Carolina at home, and both teams okay. might be ranked to start the season. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> this is unpopular, and I know, I know it is, but I'm saying like, okay, you know, I, I know there's been a recent spike in some states' cases, of course, 
But I'm thinking, you know, give it another, gotta think August, that's 11 weeks away, roughly, right? Eight, no, really seven weeks away, sorry. Um, if it stabilizes again, you know, I I, I might go. Like, in, I know a lot of people are like, no way, you can see me in a crowd, um, you know, in this kind of time. I like one, another thing, I have Joe Rogan tickets, August 15th. Okay. Uh, to, to go to a show in Orlando, a day of our movie. Oh, wow. Has it been canceled yet? I think it's going to be canceled. Um, but if it's not, like a lot of people will be like, I'm not going. I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't feel, and this is completely on the fact that I'm not interacting with people over 60 at all. Uh, my yeah. grandparents have been in Florida, so that would be a different thing with them, talking with them. And I know even their, their retirement uh, area that they live in has been easing restrictions. But, you know, okay. you think of Ford a little bit, you're like, well, I mean, the NFL has built in things, sneakily built things into their schedule to where they could push it back a couple weeks. Colleges have talked about possibly not having any non-conference scheduling. And as you know, that's those are the trips where you really have to travel. Um but I, I don't think it's crazy to think that, okay, like maybe some things can, but I don't think it would be full capacity. But yeah, uh, it seems like there's been more of a movement towards that in America that like, hmm, maybe maybe we can have some fans. Maybe we can't, you know, and I think um, I we talked about in our last UFC pod as well with what the UFCs think with that. Um, what else have you been hearing as an athlete? I know, uh, once again, I don't mean any offense, but just uh, um, that the Mets soccer is not as big as – as college football, obviously, there's not there's not ninety thousand people coming to see you as much as they should. Um, <laughs> right. But, yes. but what have you been hearing about like that smaller scale stuff, and then versus what do you think also about the bigger scale stuff of what do you think? Because you mentioned timetable, and no, neither one of us are experts at all, but just speculating at least on you know us being in that demographic of going to games like that and probably being the first ones where we're like, yeah, you know what, we're gonna go. You know, we're fine. We're yeah. gonna be okay. Yeah. Kind of so the, the answer to that is, I, I mean, obviously I would kill to go and watch uh, my college team play or anything. I mean, that would be great. But ultimately, if it jeopardizes my safety, I'm not going to do it. And and that's and I'm not a worry bag about it. I've been, I have left my house over the last four months. So let's just put that straight. But Me too. You know, the question is, how do I, how do, I do this in a safe manner? Because... You know, you mentioned then like Alabama and the football team. That's great, but and UCF, a couple of them tested positive. Yeah, of course, naturally you're going to get a couple, right? And, and I think that is something that's going to be accepted. But remember, who's who was the carrier there? And I think that's the problem is some people don't. Well, actually, none of us know who a carrier is or not, right? So it depends on your exposure, and you know, if if you do have an underlying heart condition, get yourself checked out and make sure that you're all right or find, f- make sure you're all right. Ultimately, no matter who you are, before you go and attend any event, um, you and I are not liable <laughs> ultimately if anything does happen in these events. But yeah, I would love uh, for sports to come back where you can maybe go in and see UCF play North Carolina. That'd be great. And I think from what we've been told so far is we're probably going to have to train small groups at first, um, especially remember we've all got to come in from across the country in different states a right. lot in uh, the New England area so remember Boston is still getting hammered New Jersey is getting hammered you've got New York that's been hammered um, New Hampshire is getting uh, is doing okay now but Vermont's cases have gone back up and Maine's doing all right but the the point is it, it's still prevalent you know we can't forget about it so I think we're going to have small group sessions of up to 10 i think from there as well we are going to have no fans and i think we're all going to be separate and i think our number of games are going to be limited quite honestly i think the conferences are going to have to decide if or whether they can play or not for instance a couple of schools we play i won't i won't name them uh are in are in central boston and Mm -hmm. i don't think from a liability point of view that will most likely happen um i don't think we'll be traveling there maybe they'll come up to us but then again then you've got to think hold on will the states let them come in what if you've got i mean can we ultimately can we come into the state on a bus but let's remember can we even be on a bus together because those drivers aren't coming in remember from they're coming in from all over you know i don't know the drive i don't know who the drive you know i can't just drive a bus do we drive ourselves you know, and there's been talk we may have a domestic league 
where uh, we just play teams with it w- within our state. Uh, which a point system idea, which would be cool, but yeah, it, it's really important. It is, it is really important to remember, you know. Oh, for sure. And I know, once again, you mentioned the timeline that the Premier League and such is on a different timeline. I mean, they were training in small groups a week or two ago, as was uh, the Spanish club. So you look at that, like that's where we're at now in America. And I think it makes sense. And I mean, I'm just glad at least that it sounds like you know you will be able to have a season and that some of these fall athletes as well will be able to have some sort of a season um whether you know fans or not whatever that those are the arguments you you can get into and obviously like you mentioned with certain areas being hit more i mean one that's a good example you know is louisiana obviously uh got crushed new york as well including boston a lot of the metro yeah. uh, uh metro areas metropolitan. There you yes go. there you go, go. You would think after like doing fifty five of these, uh, I'd be uh, I, I would be better at words. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, it, it is it is tough, especially now. Uh, I know that the I was hearing stuff as well. You know, you look at conferences used to be just purely you know geographical, right? And a lot of times, I think for still D yeah. three, they mostly are. But you look now at some of the bigger conferences, right? First is the Big Ten, right? Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn State. All right, fair. You know, Michigan yeah. State, Minnesota, all there. Rutgers in New Jersey, Nebraska, Maryland. It's yeah. like, okay, did we make a mistake here? You look at the SEC, yeah. right? Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Carolinas. All right, all good. Uh, Texas A&M. What? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Missouri. So that that's gonna be another issue as well. That even if you were to have just say a conference season, you know, now that the now that this realignment has occurred, you know, and I, I think of I think of UCF as well. So the American Athletic Conference yep. was created a couple of years ago. Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, is in our conference. Yeah, that's in it. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. So it's it, it's it's. I mean. Obviously, you know, I don't think you mentioned you've been outside. You know, I've, tra- I've traveled and stuff and gone by car, but, you know, obviously airports are crazy. And I do think you what you mentioned is, is our doing our, our part. And even though, you know, I mentioned possibly going to different events and stuff, and it's like, look, I'm not going to go there, you know, shirt off, chest ablaze, and cough and sneeze and everywhere. I think that's that's a key importance. <laughs> it's like you, you, can, yes. you can go outside. You can go outside and do a lot of different things that will – make sure you're one healthy because there have been many reports and stuff of stuff that affects severity of the illness is stuff like obesity is stuff like smoking. Like you mentioned, uh, with, um, the, uh, where's, um, uh, sorry now, is he at Juventus now? Well, I, I forgot. Just, uh, sorry. I think he is at Juventus come to think. There we go. Memory saved me there. Um, but you talk about smoking, you talk about those other underlying conditions. <laughs> and unfortunately some of them, um, you can't really help, you know, obviously if you get cancer, it's going to make coronavirus work, but you, a lot of times cancer isn't the person's fault that it, occur- it occurs. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not trying to say like everyone that, you know, I'm very sad over uh, how many people have been affected and such. And sometimes it just happens. Like you have different receptors that just make it worse for you for no fault of your own. I know Joe Rogan talked about his one friend who's one of the fittest guys he knows. He's in the hospital on a ventilator for 14 days and he's okay now, but sometimes it is random and sometimes it, it's not. Uh, sometimes it is yeah. like you, you're not washing your hands as well. You're, you're not practicing healthier um, habits. You know, you're not eating right and stuff like that. So I think, I don't mean this is a lecture to people, but I just think it's, also, just like when people – sometimes when you say I'm going outside the Target or something, everyone's like, oh. And it's like I have hand sanitizer in my car. I have my mask on. Yep. Like it's going to yep. be fine. Like I, I don't just grab everything I see. Like I've yep. – I'm, I'm okay kind of thing. We're going to – and I think – yeah, that's a great point as well. But in, again, not to lecture people, but ultimately just just be normal about it. Don't go and cough and sneeze on people. Don't – you know, obviously you need to go and get your essentials. Of course, that's why it's there, you know. But you, as you said, don't – don't cough and sneeze. And it's it's interesting you mentioned Boston and Florida. So Boston's numbers are still high, but they're, they're a bit lower, right? And uh, you said Florida's, you know, yeah, there we go. I was looking over at their peak in their chart, you know. At one point in the middle of April, they had 1.4 thousand cases. That's a lot, don't get me wrong. And uh, I'm looking now, and it seems to me that their trend is even higher. 
So yesterday they reported 2.5 cases, 2.5 thousand. And then you go, and hold on, that is more than you ever had now. So, and that's that's not a go at Florida. I, I'm sure they have their own systems in place. But point is, is, you know, people thought at one point, oh, the sun, you know, that'll help the, uh, people that'll help people get over this well i don't yeah, think no. it does and I, I i think that it clearly it's gonna be here it was something that you know hopefully i hope and i i really do hope for a world that we get to the point where it's rather than oh, you got covid19 to oh yeah i got covid19 i'm just gonna go get a vaccine we'll be all right we'll recover pretty soon right because and i think that we'll get to that agreed but we've got and that's when you said about playing our part don't be stupid uh, people, I mean, don't, just please don't be too stupid about it. I know, and I understand rights are important and whatnot, and there's a free uh, element of freedom. Don't get me wrong, but we've got to be careful. And no matter that, and that's from a resident of the US too. I'll do my part. You know, I can still go out on a run and everything, but I always, if I'm running past someone, I always say, "Coming past," and I always give my distance just out of common courtesy. I think it is. But um, I, I wish that and I hope for the best with every state and nation across the globe, really, that gets through it. I hope for those who have been underprivileged and have had to real struggle through this. I hope they get the support they need and I hope they also get treated. Uh, that, uh, I, that is just from a humanitarian point of view, not a political one. I hope that as a, as a world we can come together, differences and views apart, and we can ultimately fight this. And I think we can, again, with the buy-in from everyone that needs to be more serious than it is today. And I'll finish with that because I think that's important to me. No better way to finish than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. Your words of positivity and hope are awesome. And I'm I'm really hoping we can... Uh, can like periscope your game or something uh through through tv or something like that uh facebook live or something like that uh for your senior season and then um you know we can when we get more updates and stuff like that and of course when the premier league starts up and running we can uh talk about how everton continue to disappoint you so we'll, we'll absolutely we'll... that's fine i look forward to doing a football one in a, in, the, in the near future where we can maybe catch up on the end of the season and what's going to happen as maybe uh promotion relegation push that would be a good episode i'd love to do one of them but thanks again for having me on zach and and to the people as well keep your heads up or chins up as i like to say and uh play your part and uh, we will get through this together thanks again zach it's been a pleasure